Good morning. Well, you imagine you're in a church in Turkey in the first century, and uh, you get this letter from the Apostle Paul, and uh, just let's read a bit of it, just, and, and you've got to think, what is it all about? You imagine you're sitting there, and the, the elder is going to read this letter from the Apostle Paul. I'll just read a few verses. Paul checks a hymn from the early church, hymn book, as it were. Verse 15, um, have we got it up? Of Colossians, there you go. Um, we'll just read a bit because there's a lot to get through. And Paul says this, He, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of, over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Well, that is the word of God. And um, there are certain things you have to know in life. Certain things you have to know, which are essential. Now, you must have felt about certain things. I don't understand these things. You know, you listen to the news. If you're like me, you're sort of obsessed by, you must see it at least once a day, and you... You look at the Middle East and you look at all the things that are going on and you think, what's it all about? The Sunnis and the Shiites and the Alawites and Syria and Lebanon and Turkey and Syria and, oh, and Iraq and Iran. Who's fighting who? I don't fully understand it. Or else another subject that always is on every day, that the financial situation, our financial correspondent will tell you about the state of the pound, the state of the economy, you know, about inflation, about the GDP, about uh, the financial uh, index and the Dow Jones and quantitative easing, and you think. In spite of all Robert Peston's wittering, I don't understand any of it. Well, some of it. Or else... Probably more common to some, some of us of a certain age, the whole area of computers, you see. And now you, many of you are experts, but my wife takes me into an apple shop, as she does every Monday, if she can get me there. It's nothing to do with fruit and veg, you know that, you realize that. And, she, and these guys in whatever the particular vest they were in this season, show you and tell you about all the apps that are available on the telephones and the smartwatch. You're going to get a smartwatch like this. This is six pound at Tesco's. They're a lot better. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Um, but you know, I, and I think, and these guys look very intelligent and think, I don't understand what they're on about. And we've got a new television. This We bought ourselves a television, a colored one. It's amazing. <laughs> and it just does everything. It really is terrific. Well, we, you know, it's just a, a cause of marital strife. That's why we need to go to this seminar you'll hear about. But you think, I don't understand it, all these things. But there's certain things you must understand. You must understand about Jesus Christ. You must know who he is and what he's done. If you do not get that right, you will miss life. You will, get, you will never find the salvation that God offers. And you will miss your eternal salvation whether you go to heaven or hell or whether you find the power and the joy of life now you'll miss it so it's incredibly important you get it right now Paul's great desire as we look at this and he's talking to these young Christians is this what you have to realize that Christ he says and this is one of the key verses you know has the preeminence it's not that we might make him preeminent we'll come to that at the end but he actually he said I want you to know that he is preeminent we don't make him Lord. We don't make him Savior. He is Lord now, this morning, as they read this letter. Now, the problem was, the young Christians in Colossae were being affected by false teachers. 
And that will happen to the church all through the running centuries. People will come in who know better and want to have a new slant on things. And these false teachers were saying, well, this is part of it. It's a bigger thing if we're time to unpack it. But they were saying that God is remote and God is you know, inaccessible. He's way up there. But he has created different intermediaries or emanations. Christ is the top one and different angelic uh, intermediaries down to the, the person, this demiurge, who created this universe. Matter is evil, like most Greeks thought that. Spirit's what matters. And so this universe is intrinsically evil, created by this lesser being. And, and they said Christ is wonderful, but he is not supreme. I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that now. He is, he is a son of God, but he's not the son of God. And the, the, the heresies keep repeating themselves over the centuries. So Paul has to address this. Now I say this to you, because this is not stuff for a good sermon on Sunday. Christians, we have to know this stuff so that when people ask us about who is Jesus, we can say these things. So I'll try and make it simple to, you know, that we can un- learn these things, as it were. Now, he is supreme. Now, Paul says he must have the first place. Now, so I'll give you a few, he says, let me give you a few reasons. And Paul chooses this hymn that's going around in the early church to to, to make his point. He says, the first thing is this. He is, verse 70, look what he says in your text. He is before all things. He is before all things. In other words, before this universe was created, before the heavens, before the skies, before the big bang, Jesus existed. There was never a time that Jesus did not exist. He didn't come into being at Bethlehem. He didn't just happen then. No, no. He's always lived with the Father and with the Son, co-eternal in this wonderful, glorious bliss of the Trinity. He's, is he like, eternally begotten, to use a, an old-fashioned word, of the Father. In other words, he is of the same essence of the Father. He's of the same stuff of God. He's godded with God, as it were. You say, well, I, I don't understand all this. Of course you don't understand it. You're not first primarily asked to understand it. You're first to believe it. People say, when I understand everything, then I'll believe. Never works that way, my friends. You have to believe the revealed word, then light will come in. Then you'll understand it. And that's what he's saying. It's what John had said long before. As he'd written, to, not long, but a little while before he'd written. He said, you know, in the beginning was the word, Jesus. And the word was face to face with God. And the word was God. The writer of Hebrew, whoever he was, said the same thing. But of the Son, he says, thy throne, O God. He calls the Son God. Will last for and ever and ever. So Paul says he is preeminent because he is preeminent in time. He's before all things. But most of all, look what he says in the text. Can we have the text up? Can you put it up again? He is preeminent because he says he is the image of the invisible God. Look what it says in your text. He is the image of the invisible God. There's only one God who has created the world. And this one God has come in the form of Jesus as a man to the earth. Paul says the same thing to Philippians. He who did not count equality with God as something to be grasped at, to held, held on at all, you know, at all costs, he emptied himself... Became now the word empties, it didn't empty himself of his godness. What it means is he emptied himself into a human life, into a baby. He became a man. He chose to be a man. He chose to be a servant. That's what he's saying. And um, you see, what you've got to see is this Jesus we make a lot of in this church. He's not just some great person. No, no. He is this perfect person this, who is God. He's not some intermediary, says Paul, some angelic type being, some who has a phantom-like body. No, no. He is the Word made flesh. He is God taking human form. You know, he is, the writer of Hebrews says, he is the radiance of the Father's glory, the exact representation of his being. Christ is the invisible God, made visible. He goes on to say, and look in this second chapter, for in Christ the fullness of the deity lives 
in bodily form. And he says here in verse 19, for God was pleased, was pleased. God was pleased to have all his, all his fullness dwell in bodily form in, in Christ, to dwell in him. Now, Jesus is not a sketch. He's not some caricature. He's not some fine pencil drawing. He is the, what is God like? People are always asking. He is Jesus. You do not get any better picture. And if we had time to look at his life, we could see of this perfect person. He is sinless. He speaks the most profound words that have ever been spoken on this planet. He works miracles. He has an incredible influence, greater than any human being has ever had in this, in, on this planet of ours. He knows the future. And his character is the greatest miracle of all. He's full of grace, full of wisdom, full of mercy, full of justice, perfection. One of his contemporaries says he was full of grace and truth. No one like this man. No one. But this, Paul goes on, because Paul wants you to get the point. He says he is supreme because of his before time. He is supreme because he is God himself. But he says also he is supreme over creation. Look what he says in verse 16. Look in your Bible. For by him, by him, this Jesus, all things were created. You see, the heretics were saying, were saying no, no, matter is evil and was created by this lesser God. Paul says, not so. See, we're not dealing with some great religious leader of the first century. This is the claim of Christianity. This is why we're so passionate, what God has done. And then he says, look, he is the firstborn over all creation. Now, excuse the Greek lesson, but it might help. The word firstborn is the word prototokos. Now, it doesn't mean he's the first created being. Firstborn is not first in time, it's first in rank. First in priority. He, the Father has given the Son all authority. This is my Son. It's for all for Him. All things were created by Him and for Him. The, the Father has made a universe and said, Son, that is for you. He is the prototokos. He is the Son who has inherited all of the same essence of God. And that's what He's saying. He... he and we have to be aware of that. We're not just dealing with some any, any, other, any old person. And the writer of the Hebrew says, He is the Son who has been appointed heir of all things. You know? He's in charge. He made it. I don't know how he made it. We won't go into that this morning. But he, all things were created by him. Just look at yourself, for instance. Uh, let's, look at the, let's look at a micro level, for instance. If you ever do biology, you'll know you're tormented by these little creatures called amoebas. Nice little single cell animals. And, oh, just to study the microbiology of this, one cell, nucleus, of, a, of an amoeba, these little tiny things you can get a few dozens in a centimeter. In that one cell, there is more information than in a thousand copies of the, of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Not just one cell, a thousand times more information in one cell. Can you imagine how many cells you have? Or else... You know, our bodies are made of many things, mostly a lot of amino acids. Well, if you put all the amino acids in, in your body, uh, to, uh, in sort of end on, it would come to 744,000 miles in your body, which is the moon three times <laughs> in one body. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You could turn to the person and say, no, next to you and say, you are, no, never mind. But, you know, you, it, the human body is just an amazing thing. Or else to look at it on a macro level. You know, we, we are part of a small solar system with a sun and a few planets, and, um, which are in a, a universe. Uh, not uni well, it's in the universe, but we're, first of all, we're in a, a galaxy called the Milky Way. The Milky Way has uh, uh, 100 billion stars. One star is... Um, um, Beetlejuice, spelt by the, in the German, pronounced Beetlejuice. This one star, this one planet, which is 640 light years from us. You remember, I remember I said once, if you do that, light has gone round the earth seven and a half times. So you're really moving, my friends. It's 186,000 miles a second, isn't it? Something like that. It will take you 640 years to get to Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice itself, its radius is... 
the same radius as our radius around the sun. You imagine from us to the sun, all solid. That's just one planet in one, in our, our little galaxy, our big galaxy. Imagine, for instance, uh, the, sun, the sun is a, a, a peanut in Trafalgar Square. The nearest Earth would be about half a, a meter away as a speck of dust. The nearest star on, in those proportions would be 200 miles. That's just our universe. Our galaxy, I should say. Our galaxy has 100 billion galaxies in our universe. 100 billion galaxies in our universe. Now, I don't know about you, but my brain turned off a long while ago. The, the, read Einstein on this. It's very interesting. But, you know, even the, the universe to its edge is t- will take you sort of 14 billion or 13.8 billion years traveling at that speed. I mean, there isn't an edge. I know that. All I'm saying, all things were created by him. All things by this person. Don't come to me and say, I have a real problem with Jesus turning water into wine. That's not even a coffee morning break job. That is, that is nothing, my friends. All things were made by him. And that's what he's saying. And then he goes on, you see. And he says, all things were made he is before all things and in him all things hold together he holds all things together what he has created he sustains he didn't just create it and leave it you know when you buy a washing machine they give you a year's guarantee or five years guarantee and then after that you have to read this indecipherable translation of the Japanese called a manual it's difficult to try and repair the thing Jesus didn't do that. He didn't just make the universe and leave it. No, no. He says, my father's been working until now, and I too am working. When the father stopped creating, he didn't stop working. He continued to sustain. If the the son or the father were to withdraw, the whole thing would be the massive black hole of black holes, wouldn't it? No, no. All things hold together in him. That's what he's saying. You see, he created a cosmos, not a chaos. It has rules and principles. That's why science and Christianity are never in conflict. He's the God of all truth. Not just religious truth. Scientific truth. All truth. And in him all things hold together. And it's not a chaos. There are rules. There are laws. That's why you can be a scientist and and work with confidence that certain things work. (laughs) And and, he says he, he holds all things together. I mean, just to digress again, just, just think of our, our, our little planet. You know, if, if it went round any faster than one revolution a day, it would burn up in seconds. Or if the moon was nearer or heavier or bigger, the tides would be enormous, probably 100 plus feet and destroy all the coastal towns if the angle of the, the earth was any different from its 23 degrees the, the seasons would be absolutely in chaos if gravity was any stronger we would die because the heavier gases like methane and ammonium gas would sink and we wouldn't be able to breathe if Jupiter was removed we'd be destroyed probably by comets and comet debris because Jupiter protects our little planet from all that, that debris. And we'd have a thousand times more impacts from these flying things. But we're protected by this other planet. And you could go on and on. It's all sustained. I mean, any schoolboy will tell you about the four major forces in our universe. There's the, what is it, gravity, electromagnetic, the strong nuclear force, what holds the protons together when they should repel, and, or the weak nuclear force. Now, forget all I'm saying. Is, all I want to say is this. He holds all things together, right? He holds all things together. He's in charge, says Paul. This is the the claim we're making. We don't know how he does it, but he does it. Now, we're still responsible. We still need our uh, climate change uh, conferences. We still have to cut all the the tropical forests down or pollute the atmosphere and rape all the universe of of the planet of its renewable resources and pollute our atmosphere and our skies. No, no. We are still stewards. We're, we have to be as green as possible. But at the end of the day, he is in charge. He holds all things together. 
Now, some of you may have come today, you're in a real mess. You're shaking financially, you're shaking medically, you don't know the future, you're shaking academically, you're shaking business-wise, you're shaking marriagely, you're, everything's shaking. Let me tell you this, put your life in the, life of, in the hands of Christ. He is quite able to hold you together. He holds all things together, and, and he's quite careful. His shoulders are big enough for you, my friends. He holds all things together, but we must rush on. You see, he comes. The, the, the amazing thing, we never, the fact that the world has hijacked Christmas was never take us away the glory of it. The, the, what, the, the, the magnificence, the magnitude of it. I mean, my grandchildren, they got a few, well, a while ago, these strange little, did you know the sea monkeys? Yes, 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 right. Well, you, apparently you get these things, you get them online, and you get some stuff. And you add water, and you get dinosaurs, Right? You don't have to be ashamed that you know these things. You know, don't be ashamed about these things. There are great scientists around like us, you know. And, um, well, they were too slow for our grandkids because these were about three or four centimeters. They're just little triops, which are sort of invertebrates. It's a bit like sort of wood lice, you know. And you put them on a slide and you see these multi, with dozens of legs going around, you know. And pretty boring. But you can get quite attached to them. But... Uh, well, yeah, but if they fell out, you think, you know, if I could only get among them and sort them out, you know, if they weren't getting on together, that would be amazing for me to become like one of these little triops, these things. But it is nothing, nothing compared to the fact that God, the creator, became a creature. That is amazing. Get all the, the incarnation, you'll, nothing, is a, nothing will be a problem to you after that. What he's done, and he comes. Now, why does he come? Well, Paul says he's, he's going to produce a people who will live for the praise of his glory. In a world of rebellion, and people said to God, get stuff, God is going to come. He's going to come, and he's going to call from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation, a people who will live for his praise and glory. And he's going to call it a church. And that's what he says. And Christ is supreme because he's, he's in charge of the church. And he, verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church. He's its founder. He's its source of life. We talk about the head of a river, that which brings its life. It flows. And, and we, if you're a Christian, you're only a Christian because you've been brought to life by Christ's spirit, right? He is... If, Forms the church, he calls people, he brings them to life. He's the founder, but not only that, he's the coordinator of the church. He's the head, and in the head you've got the Saribram, which is in charge of many other things, but it's in charge of coordination and, and movement. And Christ is in charge of the church. It's guidance, it's direction, that's why we have to seek his face and seek his will. He's in charge of it, but not only that, he's in charge of growth. At the base of our brain is a little, a little gland called the pituitary gland. And from that gland is secreted this growth hormone. And none of us would be the giants we are. Don't laugh, please. Without, without years of this secretion, this growth hormone. And, and, and Christ is in charge of growth, my friends. Paul says, from him the body grows. From him the body grows and builds itself up in love. There's not, we can do nothing to grow the church in one sense. We can't save a single soul. We can't bring a soul to life. But we are responsible for health. We are responsible to build us itself up in love. We have to love the word. We have to feed on the word. We have to pray each day. We have to witness. We have to live obedient lives. We have to give generously. We, that leads to health. Just, if, just as you have to eat properly, you have to drink properly, sleep properly, and exercise all these things physically. In the same way, spiritually, you have to do all these things. And as a church, that's how we do it. But Jesus says, I will build my church. He's head of the body. If you say, oh, will the church survive the 21st century? What rubbish. Of course it will. You know, between each day there are between 70,000 and 100,000 new Christians every day in the world. They may not be in the West. God probably has a lot more pruning to do. Get rid of all the rubbishy churches that hang around and give his, him, him a bad name. So there's pruning. But it's all, he's sovereign over it all. He's head. 
He's coordinating it. And, but Paul goes on and he says, the great, why is Paul so confident? Why is Paul so confident? He's, he's, I tell you why he's confident. Because he's met the Lord. He said, you know, I was going on this road to Damascus and he appeared to him and he appeared last of all to me as one abnormally born. I have seen him. I have seen him, the risen Christ. It's not just the Holy Spirit is telling me these truths. I have met him. I have met him. And uh, he's alive. He's not a dead hero, my friends. He's the resurrected (laughs) God-man. Now... He's not just some historical figure. No, he didn't just create it and, and move away. Now we know that, that this planet of ours is marred, that sin has entered. Man has rebelled and done his own thing. And because of that, because our first parents rebelled, disorder, disease, and death and chaos has come in in some degree. But Jesus has come. He's, he's to, to, to re form it, to recreate it again, to make a new creation. Why did he come? We said it was a miracle that he came. He came because there was no other way. I mean, the problem is huge, my friend. Just think it through. Stop with me. Stop with me. Why would God become a man? Because, not just to give us a good example. He'd done that with the prophets, with Abraham and all. He, there's plenty of good examples. He came because there was no other way. We are lost in ourselves. There's a principle of self and sin and evil that unless it's dealt with and forgiven, will take us to an eternal hell and judgment. And this world is a mess. Now, there's a lot of beautiful and wonderful things about it. But individually, you and I, unless we deal with this problem, we'll be cut off from God forever because we are born estranged from God. Jesus says, he that does not believe is condemned already. And the problem is huge. And it will take, to put it reverently, the death of the Son of God to put it right. And so he comes. It's, and Paul, just to very briefly put it, he says, he comes to reconcile us to himself. That's why he comes. How does he do it? By making peace through his blood. Not his life. No, his death. Through his blood on the cross. Now, my dear friends, I've got my time has gone. But he comes to die for you and for me. It is mystery all the immortal dies. Died he for me who caused his pain. The hymn writer says, And can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love. Amazing love. You know, if you say you get passionate, I tell you, don't. We're always trying to cool it down. You think we get passionate. I tell you, if we could have, if we, these lot, let let me take the brakes off, I really get going. But all of us would, if we grasped it, if we got it. You remember last time I spoke, I talked about that Coca Cola machine. The guy put the money in and no can dropped. No can dropped. And you have to bang the side of this flesh machine until boom, it dropped. And some of you need to get it. You've prayed the prayer, you've raised your hand, you've knelt there, but you haven't got it. Because you're still living like non-Christians. You've not seen the glory and the wonder and the magnificence of the goodness of God. That God so loved the world, he sent who? His son. Very God, very God, he comes. And he comes. He comes to die. He who is the image of the invisible God. He by whom all things were made. And, and people worry about all, the, all these demons and there's all unseen malevolent spirits. Paul says, look, he, he is supreme over all things in heaven and on earth, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. People worry about demons and dark forces and all that nonsense you get. Jesus is Lord. These are just created things, my friends. You don't have to worry about the devil. He's a beaten foe. I'm not minimizing spiritual warfare for a minute, but he has defeated him. And he is supreme over all things. He is head of his body. I'm not worried about the future of the church. I'll work my socks off for the church. But he says, I'll build my church. He's going to build it. And you see, Paul is so confident. Because he says, 
He is the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn, prototokos, same word. Not that he's the first to be born in time from the dead, because people in the Old Testament were born from, the, were raised from the dead. People in the ministry of Jesus were raised from the dead. He is firstborn because he has defeated death. He has never asked to die. He is the pioneer, the author, the trailblazer. He has prepared a way so that when I go to the crematorium up that hill, I can say, death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? Christ has defeated death. He's defeated death. He's the firstborn from the dead. He says, this is the way. Follow me. That's why Paul's confident. I've met Paul since I met him. So, so you, I, we pray. I pray every day that you'll get it. And how shall we live? Well, we shall live. Very, don't worry. I'm nearly done. That he should be preeminent. Whatever you do, you do for his glory. That he is, whatever you do, you do excellency. And one of my great heroes is a man called Sam Chadwick who lived in Burnley, became principal of a great college in the Peak District. But how he, one day as a young teenager is in, in the church and the guy says at the front, to follow Jesus, you just have to, you know, commit to Jesus. You have to live as if you do everything for Jesus. If you're cleaning boots or shoes, you do it as if Jesus was going to wear them. Sam goes back home to his little terrace house and he hated cleaning his dad's shoes and boots. But he said, I cleaned them that day just as if it was for Jesus. And that's what it's about. You students, when you give a piece of work in, you don't go because the professor or the lecturer is nagging you. You do it because you do it excellently for Jesus. You may not get a top, but you're doing it the best you can do it. Whether you clean a house, you paint a house, you dig a gun... You do a spreadsheet in the accounts. You teach a class. You nurse in all. Whatever you do, I'm doing it for you. I'm going to do it excellently. I'm not the greatest. I'm not a great rotten brain. But whatever I do, I'm going to do as best I can. Because I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for you. Because you deserve it. You're preeminent. <laughs> and that's what it's about. You know, Johann Sebastian Bach used to write on many, many of his manuscripts. S-D-G, Sole Deo Gloria. He was a great godly man. And it was only for the glory of God. That's how we live. Whatever you do, whether you're baking Sunday lunch, or you clean the floor, whatever you're doing, you do it for him. Final word. A lady friend of mine, she rang me up. I'm, she's a good friend. And she's like, could I see her? And I said, yeah. And I went to see her. And she said, Stuart, I want you to take my funeral service. You know, you always say the same thing. You know, you, I live longer than you, you know. She won't. She knows she's going to die this year. She has terminal cancer. And she's just lovely, great, full of faith. And I said, and she's concerned about, she's in her 80s. I said, she said, and she's concerned about her relatives. I said, her relatives. I said what? Because she's the only Christian in the family. I said, what? What shall I say to your relatives? Or not about, about, you know, why you left Britain as a, a young girl, you know, very clever girl, and went to live in India, gave your best years of your life serving India. And she said, and I quote a well known quote that many of you know from C.T. Studd, who f- founded WEC, Worldwide Evangelization for Christ, down the road in Bulstrode, if Christ Jesus be God and died for me. Then no sacrifice I make, I make can be too great to make for him. Tell him that, she said. If Jesus Christ be God and die for me, then no sacrifice I make can be too great for me to make for him. Now, she wouldn't say she'd sacrifice anything. But that's how we live. That's the call, my friends, isn't it? He is preeminent. I've only got one life and it'll soon be ended. I'm going to live it for the glory of the living Christ, aren't you? I'm going to live that. He, in all I do, I may not pass this or do that or get great jobs, but whatever I do, I'm going to do it for the glory and the excellency. I'm going to do it excellently. Jesus, nobody's seeing this, but I'm doing it for you. I'm going to do it for you. Whatever I do this week, 